Ms Jennifer Westacott, CEO, Business Council of Australia. Mr Bill Scales, AO, Chancellor, Swinburne University of Technology. Professor Linda Christensen, De uh, Vice Chancellor, Swinburne University of Technology. Swinburne friends, alumni, staff and students, welcome. My name is Andrew Smith. I'm Vice President Engagement here at Swinburne University and it's my great pleasure to be able to welcome you here to this evening's Chancellor's Lecture. Our people, our prosperity, rethinking Australia's skills, vet and training systems. As we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay respects to their elders past and present. And so now it is my privilege to introduce to you Mr Bill Scales AO, our Chancellor since 2005. Andrew, thank you very much. It, it, is, uh, it is great to be here again for what is the first of the Chancellor's Lectures for 2014. And I can tell you, as with all of our other Chancellor's Lectures, you're in for a great treat tonight. I can tell you that. Uh, and as with our uh, other lectures, of course, it is important to, I think, understand why we have these lectures. We have these lectures because, in many ways, we need a safe place for people to be able to discuss difficult issues. And universities are such a safe place. We also have lectures like this because universities are the place where we can not only discuss great ideas, but also disseminate those ideas, disseminate the research, get people thinking about things in a way which often they can't do in that broader community. We also have lectures like this because I think for us they should be a general reminder to all at Swinburne of the critical role which Swinburne plays really in the broad issues of some of the substantial debates which are going on in our society. And many of you, of course, those who are either lecturing, doing research or teaching at this university would understand that this is an important part of our broader mission. But we also do lectures like this because we at Council, and me as a, in a sense the titular head of Council, do it because we want to lead from the front by being able to say that Chancellor's Lectures are, are a way for us to be able to show in a very practical way why it is and how it is that we can be committed to this very important mission of not, owing, not only providing people with this safe place but also send a very clear message that we at the very top of the university believe that this is a great message for this particular uh, university. But we also do it because we want to provide our alumni and our friends to hear some of the greatest thinkers that this country has. And tonight then let me introduce our speaker which is Jennifer Westacott. Many of you would know Jennifer of course because she, uh, through her role in the Business Council of Australia, Jennifer took up her role as Chief Executive of the BCA in April 2011. Previously she, previously, she was a director and the national lead partner at KPMG. In that role, she was the firm's leading partner in sustainability, climate change and water practice in both its, in its New South Wales government practice. Jennifer also has had experience, policy experience in both the public and the private sector. For over 20 years, Jennifer occupied critical leadership positions in both the New South Wales and the Victorian governments. She was the Director of Housing and the Secretary of the Department of Education here in Victoria, and most recently in New South Wales, the Director General of the Department of Infrastructure, Planning and Natural Resources. At KPMG, Jennifer provided advice and assistance to some of Australia's major corporations on things like climate change and sustainability matters and provided advice to governments around Australia on major reform priorities. 
Jennifer has a Bachelor of Arts Honours from the University of New South Wales, where she is even currently an adjunct professor at the City Research Centre's Centre, and she was a Chevening Scholar at the London School of Economics. Please, ladies and gentlemen, join me with me in welcoming Jennifer Westacott. Well, thank you, Bill and Vice-Chancellor. It's a great honour to be here to give this year's Chancellor's Lecture. Bill Scales is a great friend of the Business Council of Australia. He's one of those rare Australians who can move seamlessly between the public, private and academic communities, constantly adding value and constantly challenging lazy assumptions. He is a great joy to work with. Swinburne, of course, is a great Australian institution, famous for innovating and pioneering approaches to education. It has a history of responding to the changing needs of young people seeking work, to the changing needs of employers and the changing nature of workplaces. The legacy of the original technical college has not been overshadowed by the perceived status of university education. I know that Swinburne takes as much pride in its vocational programs as it does in its higher education offerings. And this is the area I want to focus on tonight. Make no mistake, the higher education system is not short of people with opinions. VET, on the other hand, needs more powerful friends. The Business Council of Australia is as interested in VET and skills as it is in schools and universities. We are deeply concerned that the national debate always seems to focus on schools and universities. I want to focus on VET tonight because we simply cannot afford to see it as the also ran of the education system. VET is a crucial piece of the national armour we need to protect Australia's economic competitiveness and social cohesion. If we undervalue VET, we will continue to push the university sector to become more of a mass education sector which it was not designed to be. More importantly, if we undervalue VET, we will abrogate our responsibility as a nation to maximise people's potential, to have good and rewarding jobs and the capacity to take up new ones over the course of their lifetime. I'm going to cover four themes tonight. First, I want to explain what I mean when I talk about a skills and vet system. Secondly, I'll offer a sense of the economic and social context that makes changing the system so fundamentally important. The third section of the lecture will identify what I believe to be the main weaknesses in the system as it stands. And finally, I want to make some practical suggestions for change. So let me begin by explaining briefly what I mean by a VET and skills system. When I talk about VET, I mean the part of the tertiary education system that delivers certificate level qualifications and diplomas. And I'm talking about both public and private providers. I know that the boundaries between higher education and vocational education are becoming increasingly blurred. Changes to the funding of some of the VET qualifications announced in the recent budget have increased that momentum and in this respect for the better in my view. For the first time, the Commonwealth will provide direct financial support to students studying diplomas, advanced diplomas and associate degrees. This is a strong recognition of the value of the Swinburne model, giving students a choice of qualifications and a choice of pathways. A second important change is making this direct financial support available to students at approved private institutions. Now, what really matters, what's really important, is how we build on these reforms so that the VET system can be better organised and aligned to achieve Australia's economic and social objectives. 
Of all the sectors, I believe that VET has the most complicated and arguably the most important task in the context of economic transition. So let me briefly outline the context that makes a renewal of this forgotten hero of the education system an imperative. We, this generation of Australians, the luckiest generation to have ever lived on the planet in my view, are standing on the precipice of three monumental changes that will transform the way we live, the way we work and the way we learn. I'm talking about technology and the rise of globalisation and the fundamental structural shift in our demographics. Now, some will argue that these changes are not as profound as many in our history, but it is the speed and scale of change and the level of disruption that is arguably different. Now, I'm not going to give you an economics lecture tonight, but let me put a few facts on the table. World economic power has shifted dramatically. Emerging and developing Asia now accounts for more than a quarter of global output, compared with around 10% just two decades ago. The Chinese economy is now the second largest in the world at 9 trillion US dollars. It is also now Australia's largest trading partner. The speed of digitisation has been astonishing. In 2014, with 7.2 billion people on the planet, there are 6.9 billion mobile devices. In the last five years, there has been a five-fold increase in the number of adults using the internet via a mobile phone. There is no business model that is not under threat from technological change. Globalisation and technology will profoundly change the competitive landscape and the landscape for work. Barriers to entry are gone. Corporate governance structures will change. The consumer will dictate how services are delivered. Everything is mobile, everything is tradable. Old jobs and tasks will be rapidly replaced by others. Some sectors will be concentrated in parts of the globe where labour is cheaper and not in developed countries and companies will source the highest skilled labour from wherever they can get it. A comparative advantage for this country must be to train, attract and retain the best and brightest people in the world. In respect of demographics, we are confronting the ageing of our population and major changes and challenges to participation, particularly amongst women and young people. While women represent 45% of the workforce, they do not represent 45% of the hours worked. This is serious untapped potential in our labour market. And despite almost 30 years of uninterrupted economic growth, we have unacceptably high levels of youth unemployment and underemployment. It's alarming that 27% of young people are neither in full-time work or study or a combination of both. This is a global problem and it will impact dramatically not only on those individuals but on all of us, the untapped potential of future generations. When you combine demographic shifts and the technological and globalisation shifts, our workplaces will be and must be profoundly different. We are moving from an environment characterised by qualifications, awards and jobs to an environment characterised by skills, capabilities and tasks. And they will be as tradable as commodities, services and products. We are moving to a world where innovation and creativity will be the difference between success and failure for companies, for governments, <coughs> for individuals and for educational institutions. For these reasons, human capital development, that is, developing people to their full potential, is going to be the absolute game changer in keeping countries and the people within them productive, competitive and prosperous. 
Countries are going to have to invest heavily and cleverly in education and training. Last week I was in Chengdu in China, a city of 14 million people and more than 50 universities and more than 130 technical colleges. The Chinese understand that education is a comparative advantage. They are investing heavily in it at all levels and with absolute purpose and intent. We must do the same. It's not necessarily about more money, but smarter, more purposeful spending. Why is the skills and VET system so important in all of this? Well, the macro trends I've described mean that to compete and thrive, Australia must increase the stock of skills intrinsic to innovation, competitiveness and productivity. These include both the technical skills and the broader competencies such as problem solving, collaboration and design thinking. VET matters a great deal because it's a core part of an education and training system that needs to facilitate seamless transitions for people across their adult life. The system plays three very important roles here in providing programs and services to people entering the workforce, people already in the workforce, people who are outside the workforce and often marginalised from getting back in. VET matters because it underpins occupational mobility and helps people retool for the new opportunities and jobs of the future. It equips people to move from lower to higher value jobs. It helps people keep pace with changing technology and changing thinking. It increases workforce participation. VET is an environment designed for adult learning. It is a pathway to a job, but it's also a pathway to higher education. And it is central to preparing the whole population for rapid social and technological change. We ignore VET and we ignore the VET sector at our peril because it will be one of the great levers for managing rapid transition. I'm focusing on VET not just because of its importance but because I don't believe the system as it currently stands is up to the task. Let me divide the weaknesses as I see them into five main areas. First, no matter what successive governments have said, future-proofing VET has not been a national priority and this has to change. Second, in terms of today's jobs, VET graduates are not equipped sufficiently to be productive in the workforce. This is largely because of well-known problems with training packages which define specific occupational pathways rather than broader learning pathways. Quality is still patchy. The system is linear and siloed when it needs to be modular and seamless. The inadequate interface between schools, vet, industry and higher education means that we haven't had the seamless education system we need to adjust to the changes I've just outlined. In terms of tomorrow's jobs, the weaknesses and rigidities in the system will be amplified by the pace of change confronting us. The principal weakness is that we don't have the institutional arrangements to imagine the jobs of the future. There is a perception of a growing mismatch between what employers want and the skills and capabilities people graduate with. It may not be a skill shortage that's our biggest challenge, but a skills mismatch. And we don't have the teaching and learning arrangements that equip people with the agility to succeed in the workplaces of the future. Our focus on qualifications linked to specific jobs will be at the expense of the broader cognitive skills and competencies needed to address the complex problems industries will face. Our rigid apprenticeship system will not keep pace with the speed at which people will need to retrain and obtain new qualifications. The fourth problem goes to funding levels, which are limited, inconsistent over both time and across the country. State governments are the biggest funders of VET, of VET and in most states their contributions are essentially static. The funding base is being steadily eroded with the weakening fiscal circumstances of the states. 
Schools get all the attention and savings in the VET system seem more politically palatable. Softening economic conditions also means a softening in fee-for-service revenue and a decline in the international student market for VED. The fifth weakness is our failure to adequately provide foundation skills in both the VET system and the school system. It should be unacceptable to every Australian that in, two th in the 2012 OECD study, one in eight Australian adults was in the lowest band of literacy. One in five was in the lowest band of numeracy. How can we compete in a global world and make the transition in our economy if we cannot address the basics? And why would we, as a decent society, allow people to face the exclusion and humiliation that comes from not having these basic skills? In stressing these weaknesses and reshaping VET to meet the needs of a modern Australia, we should never lose sight of the system's great strengths. Both provision and participation are continuing to grow. The infrastructure of the public system is vast and of very high quality and of very high value to communities. While links with industry need strengthening, by international standards, they are very good. In short, this system is far from broken, but it is most definitely under pressure. Left unchecked, it will inevitably collapse under the weight of need and expectation heading its way. So I've reached the part in my lecture where I'm going to put forward some suggestions for change. And I'm going to divide my ideas into five pillars for change. The first of these pillars, and it has to be, because it's a prerequisite for all the others, is to restore the role and status of VET as a national economic priority. The Commonwealth Government's establishment of the VET Reform Task Force is an important, very welcome platform to renew the system. Second, let's make a clear call on who is responsible to get the system working as it should. Employment is a national market and a national responsibility. A system that is so intrinsic to Australia's capacity to create and sustain the labour market should not be devolved completely to the states. I believe there are more risks than rewards in heading down this path. While competition between states is important, we cannot take our eye off the main game, which is global competitiveness. We should be thinking about Singapore, about Hong Kong, about cities like Chengdu, the consequences of state-based systems diverging from one another are real and they have significant national, economic and personal consequences. It is time to shine a very bright light on the ineffective and out-of-date Commonwealth state arrangements on VED. And the upcoming white paper process on the Federation is an ideal opportunity. My third pillar is around integration. Integration in the education system and integration with industry. Across Australia, we must provide a better VET and college pathway for obtaining a Year 12 qualification. Completing Year 12 leads to much higher rates of full-time employment, a lower incidence of unemployment, higher wages and higher status jobs. More than 62% of unemployed youth have not completed Year 12. This is an early point of integration we need to strengthen. We need to unleash initiatives like PTEC, a partnership between New York Public Schools, the City University of New York and IBM. The program teaches science and math skills along with problem solving and inquiry skills to school students who are put to work on real world problems. Integration with industry will also become increasingly important as we recognise the imperative to train people in the workplace. 
That will require different job design by employers and different educational models by providers. It will demand more flexibility in workplace relations and in the whole concept of awards and qualifications. If we expect people to retrain over their working lives, we can't expect or afford them to leave the workforce to do it. But the necessary integration will involve an unprecedented level of cooperation between industry and providers. And it should include industry auspiced validation of assessment. The fourth pillar for fixing VET is to work out who should provide what. The system is and will always be a system of public and private providers. But contestability is not a policy purpose in and of itself. It is a means to achieve a more dynamic, more effective and more innovative system. Competition has to be about encouraging providers to innovate, to specialise, to find new and better ways of helping people to learn and acquire skills. We must not have the public providers so constrained that they cannot participate in this. But they will need to adapt and change. We need regulation that supports good outcomes, not regulation that stifles innovation. For both public and private providers, we need to move to a risk-based model rather than designing a regulatory model for the few rogue players. That will free up the high quality established providers to get on with the job. Regulation must be outcomes focused, not an obsession with procedural and paper compliance. TAFEs need to be freer to operate as distinct businesses on a commercial basis as other government enterprises do. They need to be able to borrow and manage their assets. They need streamlined processes to approve enterprise bargaining agreements and, and set their salaries. The VET system, as I envisage it, will not operate in a perfect market and governments will need to be there to either deliver or explicitly fund some important gaps. For example, in teaching the skills that are very expensive to provide, teaching students in regional areas, ensuring a stable, ongoing presence in particular communities, focusing on students who need intensive help, providing that vital social safety net of foundation skills, and dealing with new and emerging workforce needs. The fifth pillar for change is to decide who should pay and how to get the funding incentives right. The first step here is to address the Commonwealth state issues I mentioned earlier, including governance. Public funding for VET has not been addressed in the way it has for schools and universities. Although governments are spending nearly $6 billion a year on VET, we are getting fewer graduates than we need. At the rate we're going, there won't be enough people with VET qualifications, particularly higher level qualifications. This is partly because the growth in numbers isn't translating into higher qualifications and partly because completion rates are not strong. The government has taken a crucial first step in extending its direct subsidy to higher VET qualifications and to all complying education providers. But this needs to be followed through. I am suggesting a thorough assessment of the real future investment funding requirements of VET, including workforce requirements, population growth projections and the implementation of the VET student entitlement. We need consistency in what is subsidised and the level of subsidy available across the Federation. It must no longer be left to the vagaries of state government budgets to decide whether or not to adequately fund this key sector. There are two other major changes that must take place if we are to have a VET system that provides a comparative advantage for Australia. Now, if we get the five pillars right, it should enable these two changes to happen more easily. 
They are developing a market for online teaching and assessment and building off what has already been done and further developing VET as an export opportunity. We have to put a global lens on VET as much as any other sector in our economy. The technologically empowered student will decide how they learn and in what market. If we don't have the funding and governance models that drive innovation in online teaching and that allow VET to operate as an export opportunity, the system will wither on the vine. But let me be quite clear. Expanding VET as an export industry or expanding online provision is no surrogate for repairing the funding and governance models across the Federation. So what to do tomorrow? I believe the first step is for the Australian Government to unambiguously affirm its national coordination role and reject any suggestion that the system be devolved completely to the states. Let me be very clear about this. What I am suggesting is not a micromanagement role and it's not a provision role. It is a strategic and national coordination role and it is essential. The Commonwealth's role here should be about standards, national regulation, working with the states to keep pace with changes in the labour market, working with the states to unleash a diversity of providers and agile and adaptable models of delivery. And it should be about continuing to track and measure outcomes. Let's use the two very important processes the government has put place in place to get VET right. Minister McFarlane's VET Reform Task Force should take a future-focused look at the system, thinking about how we remove the rigidities I've talked about and how we can imagine a world where people will not have to leave school or employment to train and retrain. The Federation white paper process should be given the very specific task of examining the national employment market. But perhaps the most important thing to do tomorrow is to remember that this sector has been one of the great strengths of Australia's economic history. It has given many people a pathway to successful careers. It has picked up the pieces for many others when the school system has failed them. And it has prepared our economy for major transitions that we have faced in the past. Our task now is to equip it to do all these things for the future. Thank you very much. I must say this was an outstanding lecture. It really was. I mean, uh, I think Linda might tell you I'm a bit of a hard marker on these things, but this was a good one. It was. It was thoughtful. It was considered. Uh, I think the other thing about this particular lecture was the fact that it was done here. Yeah, although we may not necessarily recognise it, this is one of the one of the only very few institutions who I think will intuitively understand all of the points that you have made and in fact deeply believe in them. And we do deeply believe in all of them for all sorts of very practical reasons. And uh, anything that I, I might say, uh, quite frankly, would pale into insignificance given your uh, particular contribution tonight. But I think a couple of things might be, might be worth saying. For example, uh, uh, not so long ago, and we, and we still run a program, we have a program for young mums. A uh, young mums program is a program where there are young women who have got children at 15 years of age who uh, have uh, completed year 10 and we know they're going to need to do year 12. They can't find anywhere to bring their kids with them. We provide a spot where they bring their kids with them to finish year 12 and about half of them go on and do something either in, in the vet uh, space or in the higher education space. This whole idea that education is linear is nonsense. And you described it so beautifully tonight by helping us to understand the way in which education is now 
sometimes starts off in high school and then goes to work and then go to vet and then to higher education, back to vet, back to work, a holiday. That's the real world in which we're operating and that's the very point that you made and, and this is the sophisticated education system that, that we need. Can I make one other point and that is I think it's just wonderful that the BCA has decided to take up this particular cause and I don't think anybody in this room should doubt the power of that given the number of people who sit around the BCA table. And if they decide that they actually want to make a real issue out of this, things will actually happen. And so it should. This is one of the great and critical issues facing this country for all of the reasons that you said. So uh, I've got to tell you, Jennifer, this was an outstanding lecture. And so thank you for doing it and thank you for doing it here. Thank you very much. Uh, Jennifer, as you would imagine, we've, uh, we have a, a, a small gift for you, but I, I do need to let everybody know that uh, Jennifer decided that in the giving of the gift, she didn't want a personal gift, and she's asked that we make a donation to a charity, one of the charities that she supports, called the Western Desert Dialysis. And so, Jennifer, could you please accept this on our behalf? Ladies and gentlemen, before we finish up tonight, uh, I, some of you may have seen it, but there's a wonderful, I think fantastic, uh, photographic exhibition outside in the foyer. Let me give you a bit of an understanding what that's about. That's a, that is us trying to capture the history of the development of the next building next door, the other $100 million uh, building that you would have seen developed during your time here visiting us through our Chancellor's Lecture Series. Uh, and we're very pleased that we've got Peter Garnick. Where are you, Peter? Peter here, who took those photographs. Peter is available for anybody who wants to do a 15-minute little tour around that. But the point about this is that we know that these buildings will be here maybe for the next 50 and maybe even longer years. And we wanted to capture the history of the development of that particular building because it ought to be part of the history of this great institution. And you'll see Peter's wonderful work exhibited out there at the same time, of course, as the mural that you'll see also out in the foyer. So please take the opportunity to look at that because what you're seeing there is part of the great history, again, of uh, Swinburne being redone and being captured in a way which hopefully will last for generations. Uh, again, just in closing, can I ask uh, you to do one other thing? Many of you will, and this is an ad by the way, so get ready from the ad from the, this, uh, this pulpit here. Uh, many of you would have received our annual appeal. Can I encourage you to consider whether you might provide something to the Swinburne University annual appeal? And why am I asking you to do this? I'm asking you to do it for a number of reasons. First of all, that's how we provide scholarships to the sort of people that uh, Jennifer was talking about. And there are many people who want to come to this university who simply will not be able to afford to do so. So your contribution, no matter how small, no matter how large, will help us to actually provide scholarships for people who are talented, who will never be able to make their way to a university. The second reason is that we provide discretionary research through these contributions. That discretionary research is important for a university. And in that sense, your contribution, again, no matter how small, no matter how large, will enable us to do that. As I was saying to Jennifer, you, you may not be able to see it, but down in the basement and up 10 floors, we have a whole range of laboratories right on that side, whatever it is, the eastern side. And, uh, and whatever you can help us, uh, any contribution you can make will help us to do more and more research with our wonderful researchers in those facilities. And it also helps us to actually do some quite experimental things in teaching. So if you can find your way clear, please think about us when you're making all of those contributions that many of you do make just before the end of June. So, uh, so can I finally then say again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Jennifer. It was an outstanding lecture, an outstanding lecture. 
and, uh, and can I thank everybody for being here and I do hope that you're here with us again next time for the next Chancellor's Lecture. Thank you very much. This has been a Swinburne production. Thank <laughs> you.